introduction. My name is Gabor Holmoy. I'm a professor of constitutional law at EUI, and I'm also the scientific uh, uh, leader of this trial program. Uh, trial stands for uh, trust, uh, independence, impartiality, and accountability of legal professionals, meaning judges, prosecutors, <coughs> attorneys, and also uh, uh, arbitrators. Uh, the trial program uh, conducts trainings for, for judges uh, in 13 different countries, 13 uh, partner institutions, we have in, in the program and provides a kind of dialogue uh, between the judicial uh, people, meaning judges and, and other legal professionals and academics uh, as well. Uh, such a transnational uh, training as we call this, this one is the fifth one in a row we had already one organized by one of our partner uh, institutions, the University of Maastricht on judicial appointments. We had uh, another one organized by the Hague, Hague University of Applied uh, Sciences on arbitration. We had two uh, trainings organized by the University of Florence on judicial cooperation in migration issues and the European arrest warrant issues. And uh, today we have the fifth and tomorrow followed by the, the sixth program. Today we concentrate on, on uh, accountability of, of uh, judges and tomorrow uh, we talk about the free speech aspects. Uh, I have to say, I, I listened to all uh, previous four, four trainings and I enjoyed a lot. I learned a lot uh, as not a practitioner, but, but dealing with mostly uh, rule of law issues, uh, including judicial independence. So it was a great experience and, and I was amazed how much professionalism uh, uh, have been provided by all the participants and, and what kind of help they provided to each other, uh, as well as to, to people like myself who, who are working on, on these issues uh, on a scholarly basis. So uh, this is our, our first program today, uh, which, as I said, <coughs> mostly concentrates on, on uh, accountability uh, of, of magistrates and, and uh, attorneys dealing with, with uh, both uh, national uh, jurisprudence and uh, the practice of the ECJ and the European Court of, of Human Rights. Uh, the main, main issue always uh, during those those trainings programs to, to somehow uh, assist uh, people who, who deal with, with similar issues to, to talk to each other, to, to share their experiences uh, uh, throughout. Uh, today we will uh, have first two, two panel discussions, uh, uh, presentations followed by a, a Q&A uh, session. And then we will have a, a breakout session of, of uh, three groups dealing with, with hypothetical cases you, you have received. Uh, so let me first, uh, uh, before I introduce the, the first panel, uh, say, a uh, couple of housekeeping informations for, for the two days. Uh, one of them that all the, all the uh, sessions will be recorded and we uh, have already approached all the panelists 
and ask their permission for the recording, which means that only the panelists will be recorded. So anyone in the Q&A session uh, who wants to, to, to be, re to be uh, seen, not recorded, because we do not record the Q&A session, uh, you can switch on your, your video or you can uh, switch it off totally uh, if you wish. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, uh, we know that in, in certain member states of the European Union, even certain, certain partner states of our trial program, we experience uh, certain difficulties regarding uh, judges, uh, judges' uh, involvement of, of discussion especially critical uh, discussion of, of case law cases. It's probably not by chance that, uh, that despite the very, very wide promotion of this training program, we do not have any uh, judge from Hungary, for instance. We have, as far as I know, one judge from Poland. And as, as you all know, uh, there are difficulties in certain member states. So I want to uh, encourage you not to, not to be afraid of, of disclosing anything which, which happens here. So that is why I emphasize, if, if you do not want to, to uh, switch on your cameras, you do not need to. Uh, the, the links for the Zoom uh, apply for both days. And uh, my colleague Maddalena will, will uh, help you how to come back today uh, after the breakout uh, hypothetical case discussions to the same uh, uh, Zoom link. Uh, I guess that, that I, I emphasized everything I, I wanted to. So with that, I would like to wish you a very fruitful discussion and I very much hope to, to, to learn again uh, from your experiences and I hope you will do the same uh, with each other. So with that, let me very, very quickly introduce the very, very first panel, which is about uh, we, we called it uh, uh, setting the, the scene, uh, talking about the more general, uh, uh, maybe more theoretical issues of judicial independence and especially judicial accountability. We have three uh, very distinguished speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, Tomek, uh, Tomasz uh, Koncevic, who is a professor of, of constitutional and European law at the University of Dansk. Uh, Tomasz will speak first. Then we have with us David Koshar, who is a professor at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. Uh, also uh, a long collaborator of the Center for Judicial Cooperation at, at uh, uh, EUI and and last but certainly uh, uh, not not least we have Edith uh, uh, Zeller who is a president of the Association of the European Magistrates uh, uh, ad, uh, European Administrative uh, Judges. So in that order, I I give the floor first to Tomasz and I will keep the time uh, in order to to have. Uh, time for, for a discussion as well. So, Tomasz, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gabor, for this most kind uh, introduction. Uh, I just want to double check whether uh, you can see my PowerPoint presentation, yes? Okay, so the title of my presentation is uh, Social Legitimacy of Courts in Times of Constitutional Reckoning, and there are three parts of my, uh, of my argument. First, I would like to uh, define for you what I mean by the term uh, constitutional reckoning and institutional fragility, uh, which is uh, of particular relevance for, for courts. 
Uh, the second part of my argument uh, deals with uh, building an argument for courts as uh, social actors, because we've been talking about courts as political actors. But I think the uh, current predicament that we are dealing with uh, in many European countries goes back to this underdeveloped discussion that we never had about the social uh, legitimacy of courts. That is to say, to understand this, the courts in their social setting and in their social environment. And finally, uh, which uh, the third part, which will take the bulk of my, uh, of my time, uh, is to suggest some uh, what I call signposts for, for our discussion of how best to frame the social function of uh, courts. So briefly, uh, let, me, let, me, let me first uh, draw the battle lines. What I mean by constitutional reckoning? Uh, constitutional reckoning uh, in 21st century uh, means that uh, the courts uh, and more generally all institutions that are uh, anti-majoritarian come under the uh, relentless attacks from uh, different political powers which claim that those institutions are undemocratic, they do not represent the will of the people and as such should be captured, should be uh, brought under the thumb of uh, uh, governmental power uh, and, so, and so on. Uh, so this new dangerous world comes with this overarching narrative that uh, if, you, if your mandate does not come from the democratic elections, that you are not good enough to uh, make decisions that would bind uh, public in general. Only those who come with the democratic mandate, democratic means uh, very, in, in very majoritarian and very uh, plebiscitarian terms, have the, uh, have the power to speak on behalf of the people and as such the courts do not have that kind of a mandate. So uh, with, uh, with this, the question arises, what happens when courts are being attacked with this overarching doctrine of uh, uh, enemies of the people, uh, anti-majoritarian uh, uh, themes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all too long, the argument has been that the courts will be able to fend off any such attacks on the basis of uh, their legal, uh, uh, ma legal mantle. That is to say, the anchoring in the legal system, the normative competences that the system grants to the judges to uh, decide cases would be enough for the government or any political power for, for, for that reason to stop short of actually capturing uh, the judges, that the legal legitimacy would be in itself enough to put the judges in the safe place. And I think this, this argument has been proven uh, incorrect. Uh, and I'm speaking from my own experience in Poland, but suddenly my argument goes beyond Poland and Hungary. Rather, I want to see Poland and Hungary as a cautionary tale of what happens when our trust in the institutions uh, is uh, proving to be uh, not based in factual, factual uh, situation. Uh, in other words, how to, define, how to define the social legitimacy of any institution and court in particular? And I would propose that uh, to answer this question, we have to take the uh, uh, three dimension perspective. First, to see the social legitimacy as a property, as an attribute of an institution. Then to understand social uh, legitimacy as a process. Social legitimacy is something that is in the process of becoming of a constant renewal. And finally, social legitimacy as a perception. So social legitimacy uh, as a property. So when I, when I understand and I try to analyze social legitimacy as a property, I ask myself the question, when institutions are regarded as justified and deserving of support for reasons that would go beyond fear of sanction or coercion. That is to say, what kind of attributes would make a case for the judges to wield this popular support, to garner trust, uh, to create a confidence in the stakeholders of the justice system. Uh, social legitimacy as a process, most crucially, it is not a given. It is not carved uh, in stone. Rather, it's a dynamic process. It's a vari variable 
that is a function of context, history, and culture. And legitimacy, social legitimacy, always builds as a result of renewal and practice. For, for social legitimacy to be anchored in public perception, which will be my next argument, it must be practiced and it must be renewed on a daily, daily basis. So social legitimacy of any institution must not be taken for granted because the legitimacy and social anchoring uh, always arises as a result of this interaction between multiplicity of actors and different factors then, that come into play. So this traje trajectory of social legitimacy has uh, three steps. Uh, and the first one is the one that we uh, uh, keep forgetting. First of all, if you really want to ask yourself a question, how strong are the judges uh, in the democratic setting? You have to start with the social anchoring of the judicial function. So social anchoring of the judicial function is the result of this ongoing process of social legitimacy becoming on a daily uh, self-repeating self -repeating, uh, basis. Uh, then if you have the social capital in place, you have to ask a second order question. What, how, and why the judges in a given social setting are doing? How are they performing? In order to build on this capital, which was my first step, or rather to uh, lose the capital uh, that was at the beginning, but start shrinking as a result of judges not living to the promise of the inbuilt uh, capital. And uh, my, final, my final step in this trajectory is to build a feeling of common cause on the basis of those two first steps that translates the social capital into a feeling that actually judges are doing something for the citizens, are doing something for, the, uh, uh, for defending the constitutional essentials of the state when threatened with uh, captured, in order to make sure that the people don't see the judges as simply self-interested in self-defending themselves. So this is the social function of courts. So you go beyond the self-interest on the basis of inbuilt capital, and only then you can project a social function of courts uh, of uh, talking about possibly recapturing the judicial independence. But if you don't build on the first step, you don't have a chance moving forward because the social capital is missing uh, to start to start with. And then, and then. Uh, if you have those three, if, if you have those three dimensions, then the question is uh, how how can the judges themselves go about uh, uh, building the social uh, capital, uh, remembering it as a process, and remembering that uh, the process affects in turn social perceptions of uh, of the judicial function. And I have three building blocks for our discussion about the social legitimacy of uh, of the judges. First. The judges themselves have to be in step with how the law changes. The law is not only a sword to punish, but first of all, you build the confidence and trust in people's hearts when you show people that actually courts are there to protect you. So the law becomes more and more a shield to protect against the omnipresence and uh, om omnipowerful uh, uh, state. And then you have different uh, uh, different features of this ever-changing nature of law. You have law as conflict, uh, law as situational, law as something that is effective. And this is how people understand the law. Uh, the law only reaches you when it is applied in practice, when it is uh, 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 possible and capable of changing an individual situation. And the law reaches me, an individual, by way of a judicial intervention, that is to say judicial interpretation. So stay in uh, uh, step with the uh, changes uh, that the law uh, undergoes. Uh, second, uh, try to bridge the gap between the people's expectations and the quality of, of performance. There are more and more and lo more laws. There are more and more procedures. So people do have more and more expectations of the judges and the performers on the basis of uh, 
such an ever-evolving system must be in step with the people's uh, expectations of effective justice. And uh, for my understanding of social legitimacy, the most important element is to properly understand the legal interpretation because the legal interpretation is how you build the confidence in people's minds. So not only you feel the sensitivity that there is something missing uh, as a judge, but you have to change your interpretive routine to break the status quo. No more business as usual, no more sending people away on the pretext of uh, uh, imprecise uh, two general provisions. Judges do have their own promises. And the promises of the courtroom is to provide an effective legal protection against ever powerful uh, state. Uh, so this legal, uh, th this legal interpretation element as a tool to build social legitimacy is, is extremely important. My third point, you have to transition from a right to a court, that is the access aspect, to a right to a good judge. And here the discussion shifts to another gear. You ask the question about how my right to a uh, judge is a, a, a accompanied by some procedural safeguards that would make my right to a judge a, a right that is really felt, that is really effective. And in that regard, uh, you have uh, a number. You have point number four. This is where justice meets efficiency. And uh, point number five moving beyond result-based justice. So procedural satisfaction and making sure that people do have their day in court is as important uh, as anything in building the social legitimacy. You have to have the feeling that you have been heard. Not only, not only you can say that, okay, I lost the case, but people should be ready to acknowledge, okay, I lost the case, but I'm ready to return to the court because I was heard, I was given consideration and my, my arguments were heard. And I still feel that this procedural element of uh, right to a court is still underappreciated by the judges themselves. Uh, number, number six, uh, challenge of the new self-perception of the judges. Independence as a privilege must be repaid with performance. Independence must go hand in hand with accountability. So independence is not a tool to shield the judges off from the outside world. Rather, independence is something that should be earned by the judges with how they go about delivering justice to each individual that, uh, uh, that appears uh, in the courtroom. And I think this mental aspect of independence this internalization of judicial independence is as much important as the outside appearances of uh, uh, independence. Do the judges have inside themselves this inner space where they feel independent to deliver, to deliver justice, to go beyond uh, the, the text in order to open up the system to provide decisions that are indeed reasonable, uh, just, pragmatic, this is well beyond the traditional discussion of independence as a privilege. Independence as a privilege, yes, but privilege that must be earned on a permanent daily basis with performance. Uh, number, number seven, move beyond formalism. So I, I mentioned the term uh, promises uh, of the uh, judiciary. So what are the promises of the judiciary uh, uh, in times of constitutional reckoning? First of all, you have to understand, because this is what people expect you to understand, that judging, judging is no longer automatic. Your color is gray, and you, the judge, must search for this well-rounded, balanced solution to the case, knowing that your, your decision will never be perfect, because the law itself is imperfect. Law changes, and the judges must do away with the myth of black or white, world. They no longer live in such a uh, bi-dimensional uh, world. The color is gray. Number eight, embrace the culture of justification. So this shift is from power of arguments. I, the Supreme Court, hereby sentence you to a fine. To arguments, from arguments 
uh, of power to power of arguments. Not only you sentence somebody, but you explain why you are doing what you are doing. So this explaining aspect of the judicial power is crucial in building the social legitimacy. It is not only what you say as a judge, but how you say it. Uh, number, number nine, uh, social function of the courts at the service of the citizens. What I mean by that? Uh, first of all, uh, you have to understand as a judge that citizens know about the law as much as they learn about the law in the courtroom. So how the judges treat people in their courtroom is crucial to building this uh, positive perception of the judicial power. So to refocus the perspective from the negative to the positive, at least in my part of Europe, the discussion centers too much on what the judges cannot do. My argument is different. In times of constitutional reckoning, you have to ask what the judges have to do in order to stay true to their ethos of judging. And finally, number, number, number 10, uh, importance of public perception. No longer everyone is guilty but me. Judges do have to accept responsibility because with great power comes even greater uh, scrutiny. And uh, I know Gabor, uh, I should be uh, wrapping it up and I'm doing it now. So finally, what, uh, what, lies, what lies ahead? My argument is to reconsider the judicial ethos in its social context. And in order to that, we have first to imbue our thinking of judges with the virtue driven uh, approach. So uh, art of listening, accepting of my limits as a judge, humility, learning from the other. This is what should define a process that we call good judging. Good judging that goes beyond automatism, but actually sees the people in flesh and blood. And this is how you build social legitimacy. Uh, learn, secondly, learn how to describe this new and dangerous world. You have to understand that your judicial discretion equals choice. At some point, you have to make a choice as a judge. You have to balance various interests so that the people can actually see that a judge that balances, that sees those, those different colors and hues is actually a useful judge for the public. Uh, number, uh, number three, uh, learn how to go beyond the legal text because people's expectations are not anchored in the legal text, which is all too often imprecise, uh, uh, does not make sense. So the promises are of the judges to make sense of this legislation that often uh, that all too often does not make uh, sense. And finally, finally, uh, uh, every time every time I uh, uh, speak to the judges and I uh, uh, teach at various seminars, I I cannot stop reminding myself of uh, wise words uh, uh, by my good colleague uh, and mentor, uh, uh, Justice Aharon Barak, who in his wonderful book Judge in a Democracy ended his uh, reflections, arguing that for him, judges has been always a sort of uh, slavery because every time he set a trial, every time he was supposed to decide on what should be the punishment, uh, he was standing on trial, on trial of public, of public uh, opinion. And finally, finally, uh, on, a Polish, on a Polish note, in the old Poland, at the entrance to the courtroom, there was uh, an exhortation above, uh, above, above the entrance that said, justitias vestras judicabo, which means that we will be all judged, or in other words, your justice judge will be judged, judged one day. And this, this feeling of humility, this feeling of deferral, and this feeling of modesty must be a building block for social legitimacy. Uh, once we have this, I can say that it's not just a court, it is my court. And with that, uh, any, kind, any, any attempts at capture, be it by Kaczynski or Orbans of this world, will come to nothing because the public support will be the final, the final uh, bulwark of uh, resistance for the judges. Thank you. Thank you, Tomek, uh, for this almost perfect timing. So with further ado, let me give the floor to David.
Good afternoon, everybody. Kabir, are you with us? Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just double checking whether you can hear me well. Okay, I assume yes. Uh, so, so far, so good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, thank you very much again uh, for the invitation to this uh, extremely interesting uh, workshop. Uh, my talk will focus on uh, the systems of accountability of magistrates or judges in Europe, basically accountability to whom, for what, and with which way in particular. Uh, I must say that I, in my talk, I will focus primarily on uh, uh, accountability of judges, but uh, if you could see the news uh, from the Court of Justice today, there's been an important uh, opinion of Advocate General Michal Bobek on the accountability of lawyers as well. So this is increasingly relevant topic also for other uh, legal professions. So it is the structure of my presentation. I know that we will have, uh, let's say, more specific talks on the case law of the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. So I will try to stay on a more theoretical level. But of course, I will mention a couple of uh, examples. So basically, the major puzzle is how or in which way, by whom, for what, and how much civil law judges uh, uh, are or should be held to uh, count. So there is always an inherent sort of tension between studying what the mechanisms of judicial accountability are and, and how they actually operate uh, on the one hand, and on the, on the other hand, a sort of more normative view uh, how, by whom, for what, and how much should they be held to account, which means also the discussion what mechanisms of judicial accountability out of those uh, that are available or out of those that are uh, uh, used are acceptable and how they should uh, operate. So the key question is basically how are judges held to account or how should they be held to account? And as I said, uh, uh, this must be studied uh, uh, and all, the, all this big question must be unpacked or divided into smaller questions. Otherwise it's becoming you know, uh, too complex and, uh, and uh, analytically very messy. So we need to focus on by what mechanisms are judges uh, held to account, who holds judges to account for what and how often, how severely. This is all contextual and as I will uh, show, it uh, varies from one uh, country to another how they set up their mechanisms of judicial accountability. And, and only recently, uh, the Strasbourg and Luxembourg courts entered into this area and tried to somehow, at least a little bit, unify uh, these standards, well, which is, in a sense, also a domestic uh, judicial design by supranational courts. Stepping a little bit back, uh, it's tricky to define the concept of judicial accountability. But I guess it's very important to basically structure our debate uh, afterwards because everybody uh, has uh, his, or his uh, or her own view about judicial independence, which is guaranteed by almost every Bill of Rights on the domestic as well as supranational level, but uh, very, uh, uh, very little uh, uh, has been uh, uh, discussed on the uh, on the concept of uh, uh, judicial accountability. Can you see my screen actually? Yes, we can. Okay, so it was somehow I was talking on the I was jump in. Uh, so. We try to conceptualize judicial accountability in a super complex conceptual map. I'll skip that and I will discuss only few basic issues. There is an inherent you know, tension in the in this scholarly, and I would say right now also in the uh, practitioner's debate, how to frame uh, accountability or judicial accountability. Let's say one, uh, one set of uh, uh, scholars and often courts view accountability as a virtue, as a sort of normative concept, as a set of standards for evaluating the behavior of uh, uh, judges in this uh, in this case, and they they you know formulate a set of substantive standards for good governance and assess whether the 
uh, judges comply with these standards. Of course, there is a huge, I would say, disagreement what you know good governance within the judiciary means. What kind of you know mechanisms uh, 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 should be should be used or uh, could be allowed to use, and in what uh, in which circumstances they they should be applied with what consequences. Uh, the other you know set of uh, uh, scholarship focuses on judicial accountability as a mechanism, which is basically a narrower, narrower, more descriptive concept when it's basically studied as an institutional relationship uh, uh, in which a judge can be held to account by a certain forum. And basically it studies whether there are such relations, how they operate, uh, and what are their effects. So if we look more specifically on this, uh, a typical definition of judicial accountability as a virtue is provided by the European Network uh, of Councils of the Judiciary, which basically says that you know accountability is used uh, in a sense of the judiciary being morally accountable uh, to society in in uh, in general. So it doesn't tell us much. I mean, in my opinion, it's a little bit uh, tautological, but explains well you know what this virtue means. Quite often, this understanding of judicial accountability is very broad often includes also selection of judges, even though, uh, you know, uh, those who are being selected as judges can hardly be uh, held to account for what they did as judges, because they uh, had not been judges yet. Uh, and quite often it is, you know, mixed up with uh, separate concepts such as transparency and so forth. I prefer to keep, you know, those separate, even though, of course, you know, transparency is a crucial contingent circumstance that you know uh, has a huge uh, repercussions uh, for how uh, judicial accountability operates. Uh, if we treat judicial accountability as a mechanism, then basically we need to uh, decide whether we cover only ex post mechanisms, that is excluding selection of judges, whether we cover only mechanisms that entail consequences, and whether these consequences uh, uh, can consist uh, only of sanctions or also of rewards. So basically, whether it's only about sticks or also about carrots. I will show you later that carrots are crucial as well. And of course, there is some difference between accountability of the judiciary as a whole and accountability of individual judges. But even though this is like, you know, you know these are, let's say, two ideal types, of course, there is a significant uh, overlap, even the judicial accountability as a mechanism scholarship uh, accepts that there is a sort of minimal normative core that certain mechanisms such as bribery, telephone justice, and so forth are definitely outside the scope of uh, uh, judicial accountability, even though some, let's say, uh, controversial measures in Europe, such as impeachment uh, on the global level, uh, uh, is not excluding for judges. We know, I mean, typically the United States of America, even though the Supreme Court judge has not been impeached for uh, centuries, few judges on the district courts uh, have been uh, have been have been impeached even even more uh, even more uh, uh, recently. And of course, if the consequences in the definition of judicial accountability as a mechanism mechanism include also reputational consequences, then the, the difference between these two conceptualization of judicial accountability uh, minimized. Uh, so just briefly, uh, I would like to remind the specifics of judicial accountability, because typically if uh, you're working in business, if you don't like someone's performance, you can basically move him to another uh, position or, or fire him. I mean, that's a simplification, of course, uh, but it's far more easier than uh, uh, in the context of, uh, of the judiciary, where this uh, typical technique removal from office is available only in a very narrow set of circumstances. The second specific uh, is that the political accountability of judges that allows at least certain, you know, degree of discretion uh, or arbitrariness, if you want, was eroded and later on replaced by legal ac accountability, which rely uh, relies strictly on legal standards. That's why, for instance, impeachment is not available in most EU member states. And if it is, like in Germany, for instance, for 
constitutional justice, justices, it has not been used uh, at all. And of course, the tricky point is that there is a high information asymmetry. The expertise of judging is concentrated within the guild that is within the judiciary. So it's somehow very tricky for someone outside of the judiciary to, for instance, assess how many cases judges should decide, what kind of case is complex and requires more time to spend on and, and, uh, and so forth. So that might be difficult uh, for someone uh, from the outside to, uh, to evaluate potential delay in delivering of uh, justice by uh, judges. So here are the six questions. Who is a judge? Uh, uh, so it's ad hoc judge, but I mean, of course, there are differences between constitutional court judges and uh, general court judges. For constitutional court judges, we, for instance, accept that they serve only for a limited term. In some countries in Europe, this term can be renewed, so they can be basically reappointed, which is a problematic uh point for ordinary court judges for ad hoc judges is different for light judges is different as well to whom are judges accountable that's a long list of actors it might be the executive it might be the legislature it might be the judicial council uh, judicial promotion committee sometimes judges are accountable to court presidents uh or or to uh other bodies sometimes even informally for instance to judicial associations that might indirectly decide on promotion of uh, judges. For what are judges accountable? We need to decide between decisional accountability, which is the most uh, uh, controversial, uh, and then the behavioral accountability, which concerns both the behavior of judges on the bench and off the bench. Then we need to study the mechanisms, basically to, uh, through what processes are judges accountable, by what standards and with what uh, effects. The tricky point, again, is that uh, we also need to be aware that uh, it's not only what the law says about uh, holding judges to account, but we need to focus, and I would say not also, but primarily on how uh, accountability mechanisms operate uh, in uh, practice and also or in formal rules, because uh, we might know uh, that you know in some countries, like let's say the United Kingdom, there are many let's say obsolete, problematic you know mechanisms of judicial accountability uh, on the books, but they are not used at all, or they are used with uh, caution, even without you know some written uh, uh, written uh, written rules. On the other hand, if we, for instance, uh, uh, look on the let's say Romanian uh, reforms that will be discussed later. I guess uh, it is very different uh, uh, if we look on uh, if you look at how these uh, you know mechanisms are used in in practice rather than on uh, paper. Sometimes you know court presidents might play a crucial role, even though I mean uh, uh, in disciplining of judges, uh, even though the Minister of Justice was supposed to play that role, and we need to focus on this uh, uh, as well. And of course, we need to study the informal judicial accountability mechanisms uh, uh, that might include all sorts of uh, tricks uh, used, for instance, by uh, Yaroslav uh, Kaczynski, such as golden parachutes or uh, forced vacation of uh, vice president of the Polish Constitutional Court, benching judges and so forth. So these are uh, mechanisms that uh, are very difficult to grasp uh, uh, when we focus only on formal, uh, formal rules. We need to know that, of course, accountability uh, might entail several negative phenomena. We, I guess, all know abusive judicial accountability. The problem here is that every basically judicial accountability mechanisms can be abused. But there is also judicial accountability avoidance, simulating judicial accountability, output perversions of judicial accountability when we focus on quantitative output rather than the quality of justice, or selective judicial accountability where uh, certain uh, principles, sometimes even core presidents, go after their critiques and and uh, they leave uh, their uh, friends uh, uh, to live uh, uh, without any uh, trouble and bigger pressure. If we look at the mechanisms of judicial accountability, there are tons of them. Even if you look only at sticks, it might you know range from impeachment, retention, disciplinary motions, complaints, reassignment of judges among panels, relocation 
demotion, civil liability, criminal liability, we will focus on some of them in the hypothetical case studies. The carrots are also numerous. Some mechanisms might uh, be used as double-edged swords, both as a carrot and as a stick. That might be case assignment, uh, judicial uh, uh, performance evaluation, and in some countries, even volatile salaries, even that, even though that might be problematic. The countries I know most, if you look at, for instance, the Czech Republic, I intentionally here, you know, leave aside Poland, Romania, and Hungary. You can see that there are a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms of judicial accountability, and uh, uh, they have even changed uh, in the meantime. The same applies to Slovakia, uh, where, for instance, the retention for new judges, this so-called Richter auf Probe concept, uh, uh, has been used uh, in the first decade uh, of the independent Slovak Republic. Later on, it was uh, it was abolished. Right now, we can see that uh, the amendment to the Slovak uh, uh, constitution also uh, 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 wants to introduce uh, the new crime of, uh, uh, of judges, uh, uh, basically of uh, twisting, uh, twisting the law. The law. So you can see uh, that there are even good faith attempts, uh, even though, let's say, quite problematic to hold the judges uh, to account based on the recent uh, scandals concerning judicial corruption in, in Slovakia. If we look very briefly on Poland, I think it's good to uh, uh, mention some of the more specific techniques that have not been that uh, uh, often discussed and that are, I guess, very difficult uh, to challenge before any court, either domestic or uh, uh, supranational. That does not apply to abusive discipline of judges, which can be challenged. And we have seen, you know, the challenge before the Court of Justice regarding the composition of disciplinary uh, chamber and also regarding the other aspects. But for instance, the golden parachutes, that's the uh, example of resignation of Andrzej Wrobel, Justice of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. That's only about the integrity of, of judges, as Tomasz uh, suggested earlier on, because this is something that is extremely difficult to eradicate by legal standards. The same applies to benching judges or for forced vacation of judges. Uh, that is very tricky uh, and a uh, very insidious uh, uh, measure of uh, uh, holding judges to account that is highly problematic. And we need to find ways how to, how to challenge that effectively. So in the end, if I uh, may, I would like to wrap up. I think we need to take into account that context is everything. Uh, that is, we need to uh, focus also on the political environment, the use of these mechanisms in the past, uh, and so forth. We need to take all, also into account the cumulative effects of certain measures, because one measure may not in itself be that problematic. But as, for instance, uh, Advocate General Michal Bobek uh, mentioned in his opinion concerning Romanian judicial reforms, the cumulative effects uh, of these measures, the timing and so forth, they, they make clear what, uh, uh, what these uh, reforms were after. It's a sort of you know, chess game scenario. We also need to understand that sometimes we learn only expose whether something you know, was abuse of judicial accountability or not, especially when the new legislative norms are adopted. Uh, and we need to find way, ways how, how to challenge that uh, at this stage. And of course, again, I would like to stress that it's crucial to take into account the informal rules that are often invisible, insidious, and extremely difficult to challenge, but they are necessary in order to understand how accountability uh, of judges operates in a given country. So I would stop uh, at this point. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to further discussion. Thank you, David. And the discussion will be uh, uh, followed uh, after the, the last presentation in this panel by Edith Zeller. So Edith, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much for giving me the floor and hello, good afternoon to everyone. Many thanks also from my side to uh, be invited to participate in our today's workshop. And uh, many thanks to the organizers. Uh, let me stress that AEHA, the Association of European Administrative Judges, extremely appreciates our cooperation, not only in the trial project, but also in others. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, discuss this fundamental question face to face. And, uh, but it's an online version and many thanks um, from the technical, just organizational technical point of view. Many thanks to Madalina who helps me out with technical sharing the screen and sharing the PowerPoint with you because I have some technical issues with my iPad. Thank you, Madalina, in advance for helping me. Um, I will not. Uh, I will want. Well, I will not touch issues of accountability of courts or judiciary. What has partly been already uh, done by David and Thomas in an excellent way, but only stress some practical uh, points of judicial accountability via disciplinary accountability of individual judges. Um, so I want to contribute from a very practical point of view, highlighting uh, what I know best, some Austrian focal access points and focal points for the whole disciplinary proceedings and possible weaknesses. Because in the end, we talk about rule of law and how we have this setting of accountability and balancing it with independence. Uh, this is it. So some, some basic remarks, some prime, uh, preliminary general remarks. First to start with is that the court presidents and or traditional house, whichever you have, which system are the keys, are the keys also to get long lasting influence on judges. This is, uh, is out of question and we all know about it. Therefore, they also play an immense important role, not only to represent the court to outside, but also to protect the independence of the individual judges of the respective court. They have an important role. This is important because I come back to this issue later. Uh, accountability in many ways, I don't go into detail, has perfectly been scrutinized uh, by my distinct uh, Thomas and, and uh, David before. Uh, it, that it goes hand in hand with the role of a judge as such. Um, that uh, we have its balancing independence, accountability is always uh, uh, the problem and it's always a delicate question which needs to be solved, as we know. Because in the end, the disciplinary uh, responsibility is nested within, within the, the whole um, broader objective to maintain also public confidence and trust. And this comes back also again to the rule of law. Um, one of these mechanisms, of the many mechanisms of accountability, is the disciplinary accountability. And in the final end, with the disciplinary accountability, a judge can be removed from the post. Therefore, it's also important with respect to independence to talk about it. Um, but before I go into the practical details, only some words, what also has been briefly mentioned is uh, the possible abuse of such mechanisms uh, is what we face, what we hear, what we know, not only from Eastern Europe, is either the generalized criticism against judges or against judiciary as such, or a specific campaigning against individualized judges. Specifically, when you have willful, you start willful or disciplinary proceedings against some individual judges. And actually, this is a very effective uh, means to have a chilling effect, not only on the specific individual judge, but also a collective chilling effect on many other judge colleagues. So for the bad guys, sorry to say it very trivial, uh, this is a very meaningful way. And therefore, when I wanted to stress that this chilling effect, I think, needs uh, to uh, get more attention. And I'm, I'm glad that tomorrow's topic is uh, freedom of expression and, and also the obligations of judges to speak out, what Thomas has also rightfully already said. Uh, Practically spoken, east-west divide. Well, east-west divide is very complicated or it's impossible to say uh, there's an east and west divide because as you, we know, the, uh, there is a significant diversity of disciplinary regimes, not only vis-a-vis -vis in each of our countries, but also within each of our countries between ordinary judges, administrative judges, and even between judges of different court levels. So it's impossible. There are different models and different ways. We know about the European frames of the Council of Europe, and we know about the finally starting a clarification process by the European courts, which is uh, good. And, uh, we will uh, get more inside view after this uh, discussion now today. 
So about Western democracies, as I, as I have mentioned before, as an Austrian administrative judge, I can best contribute because I know my own system and uh, uh, to contribute with some practical uh, points uh, uh, from my system as a Western democracy, so to say. Uh, before I want to go into more detail on the focal points of disciplinary procedures, some uh, general words, administrative judiciary uh, is, well, legislative power and executive power are more and more interwoven, we know, and uh, speaking concisely, the administrative judiciary uh, in each and every case must decide for or against the executive power. And in addition, in, in, the, uh, in our proceedings, one of the parties of the case is always more powerful, has more information, is partly involved in the judicial administration, the executive power. So this makes administrative judiciaries a bit more vulnerable. And it's important when we look at all a puzzle, puzzle pieces in order to check also if disciplinary regimes are in line with uh, independence. On the Austrian model is Austria has an extremely executivist, executivistic model. Cum granosalis, you can say it's a bit similar like the German model. We do not have a judicial council and we have many federal states, which means we have 11 different legislators on disciplinary regimes in Austria because of these federal states. And uh, it's complicated to say about the Austrian model. The models are similar, but not identical in a way. Thank you, Madalina, for the next slide. So I wanted to say this about Austria so to understand the specificities. First, you know, before we talk or when we talk about disciplinary regimes for Austria, we need to, to talk about the position of the court presidents of administrative courts, which is not in line uh, with European standards. First of all, the appointment of the presidents is uh, politically can be politically influenced easily, no participation of judges in the appointment procedures. This is uh, uh, for sure, and we uh, it has been stressed by the European Commission in the Rule of Law Report 2020. It, uh, we have the clear uh, recommendation of CCJE, uh, opinion number 19 on court presidents, and we have even a specific opinion of uh, CCJ on the position of the president of the Viennese administrative court, which uh, overall says that uh, because of different uh, circumstances, uh, the position can endanger the uh, independence of the judges. So we know that there's a problem with the appointment of the court presidents, and there is appointment, uh, a problem also with respect to the de facto or delege hierarchy of the court president in judicial administrative matters vis-a-vis -vis executive power. Either there is uh, the president is subordinated to orders or there is a de facto obligation to report on all issues. So therefore there is a kind of hierarchy vis-a-vis uh, -vis judicial administration, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, sorry, executive power, the local governments, which are again party to the cases uh, on which the court decides. Uh, and in addition, the, um, the court president is, so to say, the boss. Uh, the judicial, the monocratic judicial administration lies in the hand of the court president. In a nutshell, uh, the operative implementation of the administration of justice lies in the hands, which means de facto allocation of resources to the judges, determining the internal organization of the court, to be the head of all court staff, to be a member in all judicial committees, like the judicial committees which do evaluation, appointment, allocation of cases, or to chair also, delegate to chair the uh, General Assembly of Judges. So the president is the boss, and there are these unbalanced power, powers of the court president. Unbalanced means that there are hardly or yes, hardly any participation rights, no rights to get transparency and no judicial protection. So this is a problem. This is a problem of Austria and we know it and uh, it has been uh, also stressed by uh, European organs. We also have, I want to mention East-West divide. We have a, an opinion from the Venice Commission on Hungary of 2012, uh, which uh, um, has concern uh, concerning the, the powers of the president of the National Judicial Council in Hungary, for instance. 
Uh, this has been seen with great concern by the Venice Commission in 2012. And uh, uh, also, um, the Venice Commission has stressed that uh, it's, it can have chilling effect when such a powerful person uh, is present, has a seat in judicial committees. This also applies for Austria. So the same, same concerns, similar concerns have been raised by the Venice Commission already when there was a draft law in 2020 um, in the urgent opinion of 2020. Thank you, Madalini, for the next slide. Uh, coming now to practice, relevant questions, focal points are who initiates the disciplinary proceedings? So who is the gatekeeper? The gatekeeper has a very important function and a very responsible function in these disciplinary regimes. Um, the Austrian system is not unified. However, actually in most systems, it is always the president of the court who is the gatekeeper. Just remember what I've said before on the structural weaknesses of the system with a politically, probably politically appointed president or maybe politically appointed president being subordinated to orders and having unbalanced powers. So it is the president who starts, who should start uh, investigations when the president has recent suspicion of a breach of duty, which means we don't know. There are no concrete criteria. What is a recent sub suspicion? And there are no concrete criteria of what is a breach of duty. Uh, breach of duty is the same as disciplinary behavior. We, it's not clear. It's by and by clarified because we have quite some disciplinary proceedings pending before the Supreme Administrative Court. And obviously it is equated. So a breach of professional duty is disciplinary breach. Um, but this is a problem. No concrete, uh, no concrete criteria exist. And uh, uh, in addition, problem president as gatekeeper. Who investigates is the next question. The, the, who makes the investigation? After the president has seen there is a, a recent suspicion, who investigates? For instance, I have selected two Austrian federal systems. In Upper Austria, it is the president who does the preliminary investigation. And the president has also to assess if he or she just gives a warning and a reprimand, a warning in the, in the specific case, or if he or she makes a formal notice to the disciplinary tribunal. And in the, in the Upper Austria case, it investigates and decides the merits. Uh, in Austria, uh, this tribunal is composed of the peers of that uh, uh, judge who faces these allegations. Uh, again, problem with the position of the court president to have big powers in this investigatory phase. And no procedural rules exist in detail how to proceed, uh, a right to, to be heard, whatever. It's not clear. It depends on the goodwill. It depends on... Uh, Yes, the goodwill, so to say. So there are no formalized protection mechanisms. In Vienna, we have the, uh, the, the president can, whoever he wants, um, appoint a case commissioner. It is a judge of the same court, but the president uh, must not do ex ante, but ex post in a specific case, and the president can choose who he, want, he or she wants. Uh, so this is also a weakness, a certain weakness. And this case commissioner must investigate the facts and report to the disciplinary prosecutor. Concerning disciplinary prosecutor, I'll come back in a second. Uh, again, here, position of the court president as such is a problem and uh, the possibility to appoint freely a case commissioner. So who defends the public interest and who is the disciplinary prosecutor, which we have in most systems in Austria, not in all, as I've said, but in most systems, we have a public prosecutor. Again, here in Vienna, for instance, a public prosecutor is a public servant from the Viennese local government, which again, freely appoints the uh, disciplinary prosecutor, freely. Uh, and this disciplinary prosecutor, the lege is um, not subordinated to orders. That's true. But, um, this is uh, quite, makes it nevertheless quite weak. Uh, therefore, it is uh, uh, no problem, no, no possible. Uh, participation right to appoint the distance. 
And in addition, the disciplinary prosecutor can also decide whether to make an indictment against the alleged judge or not, or to stop the proceedings. In addition, this disciplinary prosecutor is also party to some cases pending before the court. This is all quite a mix, which is not really clear. In this respect, East-West divide, I want to refer to a Venice Commission uh, to urgent opinion from January 2020, where uh, it has see, been, been seen with great concern on the influence of the Minister of Justice on the disciplinary prosecutor. In Austria, for instance, up Austria, the government, the state government, which means party to cases before the court, has a right of grace against an individual judges, which is also clearly violates separation of powers. So the next slide, thank you. Uh, what kind of judicial misbehavior is disciplinary? Also this mentioned already before is not really clear. Uh, we know uh, judicial responsibility should exist only in gross uh, negligence or uh, in cases of intentional breaches of duty. Not every breach of duty should be uh, disciplinary. That's a, a European standard, CCJ, opinion number three, or opinion number one and three. In um, the administrative courts, first instance at least, it is the violation of the duty of proper fulfillment of the duties itself is disciplinary. We do not have a specific catalog of criteria which are disciplinary. I mean, there exists some criteria like sexual harassment, which, are, uh, which come from specific laws, but we do not have a general catalog of criteria applicable to judges. Uh, for instance, I want to briefly mention a recent decision of the Supreme Administrative Court in a case of Upper Austria, where a judge colleague from the Upper Austrian Court has abstained from voting in the General Assembly of Judges. And the law says you must not abstain from voting, you must say yes or no. However, this judge has abstained from voting because she said, well, I don't know what I should say yes or no about this yearly report with statistics because I do not have access to these statistics. The president uh, prepares a draft and I have to say yes or no, but I don't know what is the basis on what I should give my opinion. Well, she was uh, disciplined and the Supreme Administrative Court said, this is disciplinary. Breach of duty is disciplinary. So we know now at least, which is not really um, good, but anyway, who decides? same tribunal or a different tribunal is also relevant, independent tribunal at least. Uh, we have different models. As I've said, in Upper Austria, it's the same court. The peers decide on the judge colleague. Please remind, uh, remember what I've said before on the structural weaknesses. When you have a very powerful president who gives you as a judge uh, resources, allocation uh, of uh, court staff, etc., it makes the judges in the peers bit vulnerable. I'm very sure they're independent, but it's vulnerable. It's a weakness. Uh, in other courts, we have uh, uh, cases from my court go to another court. This is good. Uh, so, um, and example, East-West divide. We have here a Venice Commission opinion I have found from at that time, the, at that time, so-called former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in 2015 where uh, the Venice Commission has, has specifically noted that uh, uh, judges must not face disciplinary accountabilities for um, things, for structural problems. Uh, because uh, I have mentioned this, because also another example is uh, the Viennese in Vienna, in my court, we had a willful disciplinary proceedings in 2018, because a judge colleague uh, had to uh, make an order to stop proceedings because of um, because of uh, statutory limitations, as we have these small criminal parties complained proceedings. In other cases where similar problems have occurred, he did not start a disciplinary proceedings. And in addition, um, there was no misbehavior because the General Assembly of Judges has repeatedly stressed 
in the set that we do not have enough resources and there is too much uh, work, we cannot make this work. Nevertheless, it has started. And we have quite some cases in Austria, or we have some cases pending in Austria uh, in administrative courts because uh, judges did not uh, perform efficiently. So, so, is, so is the, uh, the reason why disciplinary proceedings have been initiated, although maybe there is not sufficient resources provided to them. So and, and in this case, east-west divide, similar problems occur everywhere. So the next, thank you. And uh, to may more or less sum up, uh, the Austrian problems is uh, the position of the gatekeeper, is the position of the court presidents mentioned before, uh, concentrating concentration of many different roles in one person, which again has some structural weaknesses to uh, be responsible for. And the structural weaknesses of the core president and the position of the core president specifically makes it worse. Because the core president is uh, bound to orders of the executive power in judicial administration matters. The core president is, uh, is appointed in a possibly politically way, and there are unbalanced powers of the president of the court. Uh, we also have a lack of protection mechanisms, specifically in the first phase of proceedings. And uh, this I want to stress with a chilling effect. It's okay, it's even enough to start disciplinary proceedings to have the chilling effect. And in this first phase, until you come to the tribunal, uh, you have not uh, no uh, legal protection mechanisms in most courts. In some we have, but in most courts we do not have. And most of all, in Austria, we lack unified structures, no uh, uniform uh, disciplinary regime. We have different regimes. There are no clear criteria. And we do not have joint constitutional provisions, a joint bracket. So it, it's very diverse. Uh, this is what we see, the structural weaknesses and possible mechanisms also to influence judges. Um, it depends on the goodwill of uh, the actors. Not to, not to influence judges, but it would be possible. It would be easily possible. Let's put it that way. Um, and this is what, what balancing independence and accountability in this respect is not uh, really uh, given. Because uh, as uh, David has also rightfully said, uh, is you have to, and what the Court of Justice has also said, you need to look at all relevant circumstances, circumstances as a whole, because uh, also the disciplinary regime is nested in a big, bigger picture in order to uh, look if the uh, independence, and independence is adequately safeguarded. In uh, this chilling effect, I'm afraid that, or I think we need to have more attention uh, on, on this issue. Uh, we need to have what I think what we need is more safety locks for independence uh, in order to make it more complicated to influence judges. In this respect is also full accountability in any way is for sure uh, no problem, but you need to strengthen independence in order to make it not so easy. In addition, as we all know, it's not, it's not only um, to ensure structures, but it is also Personal, personal integrity of the judges themselves, which are important. And insofar, I'm very convinced we need to learn more in between peers, the peer to peer exchanges, exchanges with, with academia, like events like today. Uh, we need more trainings in these judge craft skills as well, and also uh, with other professional court users and civil society, because in the end, we live from the trust of society. And also in this respect, I'm very convinced that judicial associations have a big responsibility and a role to play. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much for all three uh, presentations and especially thanks for keeping the time and leaving space for, for a discussion, questions and comments. Before I give the floor to, to any of you raising questions or making comments, uh, let me apologize to, to my countryman, uh, Judge Viktor Vadas, who is not only a judge from Hungary, but he is also member of the Judicial uh, Council uh, back in Hungary, a very courageous member of the Judicial Council. 
which is not the same institution what, what Edith has mentioned in, in her speech uh, uh, from 2012, that was the judicial office whose president was, was very critically uh, involved in, in certain uh, 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 issues. Uh, so anyhow, apology for, for Judge Vadas. Uh, and also just, just one, one issue I would like to to put to the table, uh, which was raised by, by Edith's excellent presentation, the, the East-West divide. And actually listening to Tom Thomas's uh, presentation, I was, was always thinking whether, whether these, these words about uh, uh, legitimacy, social legitimacy, institutional, legitimacy, political role of, of the judiciary and judges equally uh, applies to, to Western or, or uh, Eastern uh, courts and, and uh, judges. So this is maybe one of the issues we should discuss. We all know procedures against uh, uh, judges, especially in Poland, Judge Tuleya, almost everyone, heard this, this name is even threatened with, with a criminal procedure uh, for turning with a uh, uh, preliminary reference case to, to the ECJ. So anyhow, uh, I open the floor and I see Federica Casarosa. Uh, to Gavor. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm good afternoon to you all. I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce the next panel on the European perspective on accountability and independence of judges, prosecutors, and attorneys. Actually, we have uh, very distinguished speakers who are two experts on those topics. First, we'll start with Elaine Mack who is professor of jurisprudence at Utrecht University. And uh, she's gonna give a presentation uh, on of codes of ethics and conduct, discussing transparency and accountability of magistrates and attorneys. Next, uh, Michal Bobek, uh, Advocate General at the Court of Justice of the European Union, will focus on the standards of accountability and independence of magistrates and attorneys in the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And finally, uh, Sasha Zagorg, Professor of Constitutional Law and Human Rights at the University of Ljubljana, um, is gonna deal with the same topic from the perspective of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so I'd like to give the floor now to Professor Mack. Uh, you uh, all three are gonna have 20 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Please, Elaine, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Aina, and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to uh, present at this workshop. I have very much enjoyed the three presentations in the previous panel, and I see some connections uh, also with what I'm going to talk about. So I hope that we can uh, continue the discussion that was, uh, was uh, started uh, previously. Um, so I have prepared a PowerPoint. I'm going to see whether I can share that with you. And um, if someone could please tell me whether that's... Sure, yeah, can Elaine, we can see that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, codes of ethics and conduct. Um, well, actually, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Phenomenon uh, when we uh, consider developments around the globe, uh, we see uh, that there's a proliferation uh, of codes of ethics and conduct for legal professionals um, over the past decades. Uh, so here in the slide, I've projected a few of the well, the, the older ones, uh, which have uh, inspired. 
uh, also the development of codes elsewhere in the world. Uh, so uh, for judges, especially the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct, uh, which were adopted in 2002, have been, uh, well, those were developed by a group of judges uh, in the framework of the United Nations. Uh, but we can see also in Europe that in a lot of national codes, uh, this document has served as an example. Uh, another um, uh, country where uh, codes of conduct, codes of ethics uh, have been developed already uh, well, for a long time is the United States. Uh, so here we see that both for judges and for lawyers, the American Bar Association has um, uh, played an important role. Uh, but I want to uh, focus our discussion on Europe uh, and uh, European uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and then to see what um, we can learn uh, about the developments of these codes and how they can play a part in dealing with the current uh, issues that uh, judiciaries uh, uh, and, uh, and also um, well connected legal professionals are struggling with. Uh, so first of all, what are we talking about when we talk about codes of ethics? Um, interestingly, uh, in comparison with uh, disciplinary norms and, and rules, uh, codes of ethics, they have um, a, well, mostly a, a positive outlook and they um, well, present some aspirations for legal professionals uh, on how to be a good judge or a good lawyer. Uh, and there we see that uh, when um, codified uh, these uh, codes of conduct, codes of ethics, uh, they are seen uh, as documents which can help to motivate legal professionals to be uh, the, the best at what, they, uh, uh, what their profession requires. Uh, those codes, they can also help them to account for their actions um, because uh, a lot of codes, uh, well, most codes actually are uh, public or available on websites uh, and we can find English translations uh, even of most codes of ethics uh, for judges in Europe. Um, a third function is also education. Uh, so it was mentioned previously already, uh, but uh, in order for, for legal professionals to become the best uh, at their job, education is important and there are these codes can also play a role. Uh, and finally, uh, the codification uh, of uh, specific norms of conduct can provide an opportunity to innovate. So to set new goals, uh, for, for, example, for example, for systems in transition. So um, I want to um, go a step further now in this presentation and consider the uh, background of the development of codes of ethics for judges uh, in Europe. I will mostly fo focus on judges in this presentation, but of course we can expand it to other professions. Uh, then see uh, what uh, can those codes, these kind of codes offer in the European legal context, uh, so in, in also in terms of dealing uh, with tensions on the rule of law and judicial independence in different member states of the European Union. Uh, and then as the last part of the presentation, I want to look at uh, the specific content of a few codes uh, and um, also uh, present some uh, insights on experiences uh, with, uh, with codes and make some suggestions for further empirical research into that. Now the background, uh, first of all, so why do we have so, so many codes uh, of conduct? Uh, I mentioned it's a global phenomen a phenomenon. So over the past dec decades, we see uh, that uh, a lot of uh, principles and standards for judging and for lawyering have been written down. Uh, in my current research, we have found for the European Union, uh, for, for 20 member states out of 27, we have found published codes, and maybe we are still missing a few, then it, it uh, would be really helpful maybe also from this audience to receive uh, directions. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we see, um, well, it's, yeah, it, it's um, a collection then of, of values and principles, but um, especially in transitional uh, contexts such as post-communist states, we see that codes often are more specific, setting out specific, uh, certain duties uh, with uh, the reference that um, the code can then play a role in evaluations of the performance of, of judges or prosecutors. Um, so, uh, well, there's this tendency of writing down uh, the, the values and principles, and here we can again make a link to this uh, notion of social legitimacy uh, of uh, institutions. Uh, for uh, judiciary specifically, I think we can notice uh, that 
uh, where um, traditionally legitimacy from the general public was a top-down affair. So um, judicial institutions had received uh, authority from the powers that be, and that was enough for the people. We see that in the current society, uh, there is this uh, societal demand for transparency and accountability of institutions. And so judges, uh, or they, they are called for more to explain uh, their actions, not just through their judgment and the reasoning, uh, but also uh, in their conduct inside and outside of the courtroom. And here, ethical codes, they give them guidance on how to go about that. Uh, we also see that um, the increased complexity of laws and, and also of European and global interaction uh, is another reason for codifying principles and standards in order to help uh, legal professionals to navigate uh, that complex landscape. Well, then in transitional context, I would say there's uh, maybe an additional reason for codification because it also allows for modification of the applicable principles and standards. And that's this idea of innovation uh, of professional rules that are referred to. Interestingly, there's a transnational aspect in many of the codes, uh, meaning that there are references to codes from other jurisdictions and also to European and global standards, such as the Bangalore principles. Uh, almost all of the national codes that we found have been translated in English uh, and published on websites, even the French one. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting that apparently judiciaries in European countries, they, they feel that there's a need or an interest to share their principles and standards with the general public and their peers elsewhere. Uh, and thirdly, there's a relevance uh, to uh, this um, codification uh, when we look at ambitions of the European Union. Um, and here I refer to the idea that, uh, to an idea that was presented um, by the former EU Justice Commissioner Vivian Redding on the establishment of a European judicial culture. Uh, in a lecture uh, that she uh, gave, I think it was at the European University Institute in uh, 2010, uh, she uh, presented this idea and said, well, if we really want European legal cooperation to work, uh, we uh, need to have not only the treaties uh, and, and certain mechanisms of cooperation in place, but we also need to look at the underlying ideas and create shared practices. And she said, well, we need to take all the lawyers on board, judges, legal practitioners, barristers, uh, solicitors, and law professors. So that's the um, idea of a European judicial culture. Here, I think that codes of ethics uh, are, um, well, have um, a, a very good opportunity to make an impact um, because uh, those codes of ethics, they very much relate to ideas and values that we have of the judicial prof professions. Uh, so for judges, first of all, uh, independence and impartiality, uh, but also professionalism and integrity are covered in codes of ethics. Uh, secondly, if we want to put um, those uh, ideas into practice, codes of ethics already give us a first step of doing that because they um, well, give more or less concrete uh, principles and standards and therewith uh, a point of reference for judges and for uh, judicial institutions to develop new routines. Of course, all of this depends very much also on the environment. So there should be an institutional environment which enables that kind of uh, development. Uh, and here, uh, the um, uh, Guide to Judicial Conduct in the Netherlands is particularly interesting because the last section of that code sets out uh, obligations for the legislature and the executive branch of government in order to enable judges uh, to fulfill their professional role in the best way possible. Now, when we consider this um, concept of a European judicial culture, that also uh, what the ethical dimension, then I would say we could say, consider that as one of the main pillars. Uh, the other ones are the legal dimension. So that's a well, more familiar uh, uh, field, I think, for uh, lawyers and, and judges. So that's about the rules and case law. Um, but then there's also an institutional dimension, uh, which is interesting, uh, and that's what happens in uh, European networks, uh, because uh, networks uh, of judges, for example, uh, they are a place uh, where professionals can meet, uh, learn about each other's background and share their ideas and practices. 
Uh, so in my group, one PhD candidate who you can see uh, in the background on this photo, uh, she's doing research into uh, the, the practices of European judicial networks uh, to see uh, what is happening there and how that contributes to uh, the realization of such a European judicial culture. Now we could of course further discuss on whether it's actually a good idea and uh, what we think of the EU's ambitions in this regard. Uh, for now, um, I think I want to emphasize that these networks, they also show that it's not just a top-down development from the European Union, who works with trainings and uh, improvement of, of sharing of information, but it's very much also a bottom-up development from within national judiciaries, uh, where there is, well, mostly uh, in most countries, a small group of judges who are very much involved and active in building European connections. Uh, but then uh, finally, let's have a look at the content of some codes of ethics. Uh, I'm still in the process of analyzing what we found in my project, so I won't be able to, to draw really general conclusions. Um, but there are a few things that stand out, uh, first of all, from a theoretical perspective. Uh, when we consider um, what, what are these codes, is it kind of soft law, which then can be applied in evaluations of judges? Or should we rather see uh, the codes as uh, well a, a description of soft skills, so skills that uh, judges and other legal professionals should display in their work? Um, in um, analysis that scholars have made, uh, it has come to the fore that well, actually having more uh, legal norms is not the, the, the um, most uh, well most beneficial impact that code, code of ethics uh, could uh, could have. Uh, so um, in quite a few systems, uh, they are more seen as non-binding norms, uh, which, which do help legal professionals to find their way. Uh, and then the skills aspect, helping judges, uh, for example, to, um, create, well, to develop more moral sensitivity uh, to the cases that they're judging and the context in which they do that. And also uh, providing insights uh, into um, uh, well, also social psychology, so what do, for example, biases, um, what can they uh, have as an effect in um, judicial work, uh, how can judges um, uh, well, deal with perceptions of procedural justice, their coach can help them by giving very concrete guidance. So we could say that, in a sense, um, codes of ethics could help uh, judges to ensure the moral quality of their uh, adjudication uh, and here virtues uh, come back. Uh, there are uh, there's a field of scholarship which has, has developed a virtue ethical outlook uh, on judging, uh, and there we see that then um, general virtues which come to the fore are uh, perception of what is required in the case, not just legally but but more holistically. Um, there's also the, well, uh, the virtue of courage of judges, so to take difficult decisions, uh, even when there's pressure from the parties or the, uh, or the um, political and societal context. Uh, the virtues include uh, temperance, uh, so not well, yeah, dealing, dealing with the question to what extent judges can use emotions or show emotions when they uh, interact with parties. Uh, and uh, justice is also involved here. So this, the idea of justice, and that could be social justice, but there it depends also on developments and debates in society. Uh, and more um, legal virtues then are independence and impartiality. Now, when we consider how um, those kind of virtues have been uh, written down in codes, we do see a difference when we look at two examples. Uh, so here is a first example from the uh, code for judges and prosecutors in Romania. Uh, and there we see what the code actually um, is called a deontological code. So it, it says itself that it focuses more on, on duties. Uh, there we do see that um, the uh, code sets out to describe criteria for evaluation of the professional act activity of judges and prosecutors. So it's, well, there, um, more focused uh, at um, describing really a standard for performance, which can be evaluated. Uh, then when we compare that with uh, the Guide for Judicial Conduct in the Netherlands, we see that that on the other hand is much more open-ended and it says it gives a framework for judicial conduct, but then gives responsibility to individual legal professionals uh, to 
um, use that as guidance when uh, exercising their duties. Uh, so you're, I think it's, uh, it's an, a question that is still open. What is the actual, um, how can codes of ethics be used actually? Uh, and I looked it up uh, within the framework of the uh, Council of Europe um, that uh, there are um, actually the committee of ministers uh, in its recommendation uh, of 2010 um, said specifically where there should be codes of ethics, uh, which include principles, uh, but also duties that may be sanctioned by disciplinary measures. So the, the committee of ministers seem to um, respond well also to the Romanian approach, whereas the uh, Conservative Council of European judges uh, said um, that um, a code of ethics uh, well, should be drafted by judges themselves and should be clearly distinct from disciplinary rules. Uh, so um, they, well, there it seems that uh, also within uh, that framework, there's a difference of opinions on this. And now very, uh, to conclude very, very quickly, uh, there's empirical work uh, in progress uh, on codes of ethics. In my own uh, studies, I'm uh, looking at experiences that judges have. Uh, are they actually aware of the existence of code? Do they consult it? Do they use it in professional debates? Uh, and what do they consider to be the effects in disciplinary proceedings or in internal evaluations of their work? Uh, besides that, uh, there is empirical work already, which is very interesting when we think uh, of, uh, the, um, uh, of ethics. Uh, and uh, there, are, I just want to mention a book that came out earlier this year, which was written by Frans van Dijk, a, a colleague at Utrecht University. And his main qu question was um, based on surveys uh, among different audiences on the independence of judges in European countries. Can we find that there's a lack of alignment or a disconnect between the judiciary and society. He did find uh, in, in certain countries that yes, there was a lack of alignment or even a disconnect. Uh, and uh, what causes this? Uh, and there, the empirical research um, yeah, does show that um, being transparent uh, about uh, what people can expect from the judiciary, well, that's one of the first uh, starting points. And then judges showing that they account for other um, professional work, that's, uh, that's the second important thing to do. Now to wrap this up, uh, I um, hope to have shown that national codes of ethics and also European uh, um, ideas about this, that they can help individual legal professionals just by well, giving them a very general guidance uh, on values and principles for their professional role. But also these code of ethics, they clarify that uh, there's a uh, demand for action also of other institutions, uh, such as legislatures and executive, uh, the executive power to enable uh, judges to do their work properly. Uh, and there in the European uh, field, we see that uh, codes of ethics, but also um, networks uh, that they can help to create support from uh, different uh, uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, think of the, the, rope, uh, the March of a Thousand Ropes uh, in uh, Warsaw uh, that can actually put pressure on national governments to uh, take up that role of creating the enabling environment. Uh, well, and then finally, towards the general public, uh, codes do help in creating transparency and accountability. Um, I'm not uh, fully optimistic because I think there are pros and cons of codification of ethical norms. Um, a, a benefit is that well, we can clarify what they are and what they mean, and I can then also develop shared norms uh, across systems. But there's also a risk uh, that they become hard standards uh, and that they can play a non-intended or actually maybe an intended role, role in disciplinary procedures. So what's to do? I think continue academic and professional uh, debates in which we learn more about the nature and usefulness uh, of codes, thinking also in terms of soft law and soft skills, uh, to further develop professional ethical thinking uh, among legal professionals through um, well, uh, knowledge sharing, but also through uh, trainings, uh, and to further reflect on the relevance of shared European norms and standards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Elaine, for such a thoughtful presentation. And now I'll give the floor to uh, Michal Bobek, if you are ready.
Ja. Michal? Ja, uh, yeah. oké. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, we may switch. I was already thinking about it. Because I already prepared my slides and I will share them now with you. Uh, okay. To find the right one. Okay, I think this is the one. So uh, nice to have you here. And thank you for all my predecessors uh, for giving me uh, enough uh, material to, to just add up uh, what I want to say in a more technical way. Because, uh, I was asked to present uh, standards of accountability and independence of magistrates and attorneys in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, uh, I wanted to add up uh, to what probably Avocat General Miha Boy would say. Uh, you know, I wanted to make some <laughs> distinction between the EU legal system and judicial system and European Court of Human Rights judicial system. And I, I just uh, stressed out uh, what are these particularities, specificities of the European Court of Human Rights judicial system. As you know, it's a super, super national court where, where primary role lies with the contracting parties. Uh, as I said many times, margin of appreciation plays an important role in it as well as, well, as, well as with the right to uh, independent judges as well. Uh, there are some uh, there are some limits to jurisprudential scope, for example, such as court instance doctrine, uh, and of course, uh, member contracting parties cannot avoid the scrutiny of the court in the field of convention rights. And as we know, convention is a ruling instrument. Uh, further on, uh, there's no explicit reference to the independence of judges as a convention right at the moment. Um, However, the rule of law as a concept is mentioned in the preamble. And as you know, independence of judges is an inherent part of the rule of law. Uh, I would like to ask four questions. There are more, more like general ones. I am not strictly dealing with individual cases concerning the accountability because I believe uh, every decent judge or lawyer is able to decipher the logic behind them individual cases. Uh, so I would like to raise four more major issues uh, which may give a broader picture uh, how to understand the logic of the European Court of Human Rights in light of all these points of departure that I have already mentioned. The first question would be on the constitutional principle of separation of power, whether it is actually just uh, judiciable before the European Court of Human, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. The second question would be, to what extent the, the international standards of judicial independence and accountability impact the case law of the European Court of Human Rights? And more technically, how did the European Court of Human Rights set up on the basis of, on the basis of Article 6 of the Convention? And I will, uh, on purpose, exclude other articles, such as 8, 10, 14, 5, uh, Article 1 of the Protocol 1. Uh, because uh, uh, at least partially we will deal this uh, tomorrow on the freedom of expression uh, concerning Article 10 issues. Uh, so how did the court set up the model of protection of the judiciary from unlawful external influence or even internal influence? And uh, lastly, this is something that I, I uh, started thinking more or less today following the uh, opinion of the very, uh, relevant uh, of General Michal Bobek in the case of the uh, C55-20 uh, as of today. Uh, so how, the, how to reconcile the latest development in some member states of the European Union with the principle of the equivalent protection as structured by the European Court of Human Rights in the Bosphorus uh, line of case. So these are my four, four questions. Uh, the first one is quite a simple one because it, it was answered already by the court. Uh, it is a general constitutional principle of separation of powers. However, it is not protected directly by the Convention, although the court recognizes the growing importance to the notion of separation of powers and importance safeguarding the independence of the judiciary, the very famous Baca case. Uh, however, on the other hand, the court says none of the provisions of the Convention require states to comply with any theoretical constitutional concept. 
And so for, from these two uh, lines of thought, uh, the court uh, concludes that, of course, for the independence of judges and judiciary, of course, uh, uh, the moment and the aftermath of the appointment is really substantively crucial. So uh, the fact that the executive may play a role in the appointment of judges may not be per se contra uh, the convention standards. However, uh, if judges once appointed, they are free from influence or pressure when carrying out their adjudication. This is the standard. So this is the separation of power in practice of the human rights. Uh, concerning the second question, uh, to what extent uh, individuals or even judges before the European Court of Human Rights may rely on the standards uh, concerning uh, independence of judges uh, and accountability of judges in the national arena? So, whether it's just a soft law or we may find some more nuances or more uh, power given to the standards by the jurisprudence of the court. Uh, I, here you have a list, uh, for example, of some of the references that the court made uh, uh, in the explanatory part of the judgments, uh, several judgments, and you, you see that uh, the court relies on many influences, such as UN standards, Council of Europe, internal Council of standards, and of course even the standards of the professional groupings, uh, such as consulted Council of European Judges, and even they try to take influence from the comparative law, uh, from the EU and of course Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So, but so far what we have seen, this is just a reference to it, and but it actually in addition strengthened the general understanding that the rule of law is a precondition of the whole convention system, and of course that independence of judges as such is actually a building block of this logic. Uh, however, the court does not uh, says, uh, say that the, uh, the independence of judges uh, is actually uh, a customary international law, as it was, the, this was mentioned in one of the separate opinions in the, in the I believe in the very famous Icelandic case, the uh, Arthur Ar 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 So, uh, Systemic issues I would like to raise is just, just to mention them, uh, concern preconditions for the independence of judges. We are not talking about the individual case, we are talking about this, uh, what are the preconditions and this, they may relate of course to the issues of accountability if uh, other uh, uh, powers uh, in, the, in the specific nation or in the specific, specific, specific state actually interfere with, uh, for example, mode of appointment of the ju judges, uh, interfere with the stability of, uh, of the term of office of judges, the existence of guarantees against outside and inside pressures, and of course, uh, the appearance of independence that is actually a part of the general independence of judges. And of course, uh, we've noticed that uh, the court started to relate independence, impartiality, and the rule of law as an inseparable uh, element. Uh, uh, of course, uh, meaning that the appointment of judges actually may influence the, the consequences of, of an individual case. Uh, however, the whole standard, that's the main standard behind on the whole practice of the European Court of Human Rights, it's not related to the uh, terms of such as independence, such as uh, rule of law, but however, the confidence. The, I believe this relates to what uh, Thomas started uh, uh, in his uh, introductory lecture today. The confidence, uh, uh, which is such as Bruno's must inspire, not only uh, in the ranks of the judiciary, but in the public, in the democratic society, there's a strong relation, of course, between the rule of law and uh, democracy. And of course, this is more indivi individually related in the parties to the proceedings. Um, in addition, uh, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights uh, strongly relates intentions of the legislator that has to be met by the adjudica adjudication system uh, in relation to the rule of law. 
so that the tribunal has have to be established in conformity with the intention of the, let's say, generally benevolent legislative leg, legislature. Uh, governments may not rely on separation of uh, uh, of legislation and all, any other provisions of domestic law in order to avoid uh, scrutiny of the court. So the law in the meaning of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Convention comp actually comprises any legal rule or measure within the member state that may uh, impact the concept of independence of judges. And of course, the main standard, the one of the main standards, of course, judicial organization should not depend on the discretion of the executive. Uh, in terms of individual issues, this is something that already uh, David uh, talked about today. It's actually this is thematic. Uh, who may apply, uh, uh, who, who may raise the issues of uh, independence of judges before the court? It may be a part of the proceedings or a judge concern. Uh, on what it may be based, I already mentioned several articles that may be relevant. I will focus today only on the paragraph one, article six of the convention. And of course, what is the goal of this uh, application? Is in order to, it is to protect the judiciary from several unlawful external or internal issues. Uh, I believe the main case uh, uh, in the field of uh, uh, having an applicant uh, part into judicial proceedings would be Goodmundur Andre Asatson versus Island, very famous Atlantic case, uh, where the court uh, actually established several, uh, actually re recalibrated several standards before what is considered as a tribunal established by the court uh, in a very highly contentious case. If you, if you read the, uh, concurring or uh, dissenting, partly from dissenting uh, opinions of judges, uh, you may see that there is a huge dissatisfaction with the logic behind it, this case, or even uh, the disability of this concrete case and results uh, taken from this case in terms of the doctrine that the court applied in this case. So, uh, but however, uh, nevertheless, I would say this case is very much important for the independence of judges because it actually uh, relates uh, uh, a notion of tribunal established by law and the conditions of independence and impartiality. And of course, uh, that it, it confirms what was known in professional circles and, and in the, let's say, um, international standards that uh, it is inherent in the very notion of a tribunal that it is composed of judges elected on the basis of merit. And of course, that the process, as uh, Thomas already mentioned, the, the process is relevant. The process necessarily constitutes an inherent element of the establishment of a court. Uh, these are some other uh, uh, interactions between the law, uh, independence, and impartiality. Uh, the court emphasizes not only personal independence of a judge, but also institutional independence uh, at, at the initial stage of an appointment of a judge, starting there and of course later on during the service. Uh, yeah, one of the relevant cases actually relates to the, to the effect of this judgment. To what extent may such judgment, uh, but finding of a violation, actually play a role in uh, restitution of a, let's say, an integrum, uh, whether it is possible to reinstate the uh, situation before the breach actually happened in the national uh, environment. And the court, of course, uh, sees the problem with two major legal principles, such as rest and judicata and the principle of irremovability of judges, and uh, how to make, uh, uh, let's say, uh, consistent and coherent uh, compromise between this uh, partly excluding principle and the, the court uh, uh, strives for a balancing uh, uh, approach and allows a certain margin of appreciation for national authorities and establishes three-pronged test uh, 
which is much a bit more stringent than just flagrant breach that was uh, presented by the chamber judgment. Uh, as you know, the Icelandic case ended in the grand chamber judgment and the standard is much more nuanced. However, uh, I, will, I find it a problematic from the viewpoint that in practice it may uh, allow uh, too much of a leeway for national authorities and by doing so the court itself diminishes uh, the practical importance of the judgment uh, in particular with these uh, those states that are uh, in a way not so uh, um, let's say honest uh, they're not uh, acting in a good state as we already have some experience with by now um, so in the other part uh, of my presentation would be when a judge is acting as an applicant before the court. Uh, I believe the, the leading case in this case is a very famous, Baca versus Hungary Steel. I believe all other cases are uh, continuing with this very logic. Uh, but I, I believe that we may expect some of, some of the developments in the holy saga of cases, which I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, so what we have seen, seen Seen here, Baca was very important uh, in coining uh, uh, civil limp of the Article 6 uh, by uh, equating uh, civil servants and judges for, uh, in order to understand that uh, the rights of a judge may be understood as civil rights uh, by a little bit expanding with the Vilho, Eskin, and, and other line of cases. Uh, however, we know that in principle, presumption that Article 2 apply, uh, member state contracting parties have two exceptions uh, uh, to fulfill in order to uh, be exempt from the Article 6 uh, uh, adjudication. Uh, and they are quite stringent. So I believe in practice, uh, it will be really hard for uh, contracting states to uh, avoid uh, judicial overview review by uh, the European Court of Human Rights because the constitutional standard would actually not allow such an exce exception in practice. Uh, finally, uh, for the comparison uh, between judges and public prosecutors and attorneys, I would say in principle, same protection applies uh, uh, as the one provided for judges uh, while taking into account uh, several specificities, specificities uh, for public prosecutors and attorneys. Um, concerning the legal effect of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, we all know they are in principle declaratory. However, there are some attempts to overcome uh, Article 6 uh, deficiencies. Uh, for example, in the case of Alexander Volko, there was an instruction to reinstate the judge, which uh, I find very promising. However, uh, however at the end, uh, it's all uh, uh, summarizes down to the uh, good faith of a specific state. As I already mentioned, uh, there's a lot of balancing uh, between the several principles. The, the issue that I uh, see as problematic is no recognition of the binding nature of the court of human rights judgments. Uh, for example, uh, in the last few days we have read, I haven't been uh, totally informed of what was going on, but I read some comment that the Polish authorities uh, uh, declared uh, the judgment in the Xero floor versus Poland as ultra virus, uh, which is uh, in a way quite problematic stomp by national authorities, uh, especially by declaring this un unilaterally. And of course, uh, the general issue of practic practical meaning of the judgment to the dis disobedient contracting state. Uh, uh, by, for example, that the state of court does not want to implement the judgment in, uh, as a follow up uh, to the standards uh, that the European Court of Human Rights apply. So, the fourth question I would like to raise is uh, as of today, uh, the issue is that, uh, as you know, that the European Court of Human Rights applied uh, for the member states of the European Union a specific principle of equivalent protection. Uh, uh, through Bosworth saga, and uh, by this, of course, uh, European Court of Human Rights is more reserved to uh, 
engage in, in the substantive review of individual cases where uh, contracting states of the European Convention of Human Rights were actually fulfilling obligations from uh, the European Union uh, legislation. And uh, the standard itself uh, is rebuttable. It, there, it's a principle uh, of equal protection that may be rebutted by uh, expressing, uh, by uh, reasoning mani man manifestly deficient uh, legislative setting uh, or executive, executive setting of the uh, EU uh, judicial system and legal standards. Uh, and uh, I get the idea that, that it might be a problem now, from now at least we have to raise this as an issue. Is, uh, is from, I got the idea from the uh, opinion of uh, Advocate General Michal Bovek, uh, issue today, uh, that because he expresses some concerns, the preliminary ruling mechanism, that it's not ideal in specific cases, and it actually relates to the specific cases of protection of rule of law within the European Union. And uh, what we have seen, of course, uh, uh, Advocate General uh, emphasizes varying practical value of available legal mechanism in highly contested disputes. Uh, and uh, he declares the references for a preliminary ruling might not be ideal for dealing with, uh, let's say, uh, opposing, specific opposing uh, member states of the European Union uh, in a highly contested dispute. Uh, he, uh, he believes that infringement actions are much more relevant and appropriate. However, what I see uh, from the perspective of the European Court of Human Rights Judicial System, of course, uh, infringement actions do not allow individual applicants to, detect, to, to influence the European Commission or other member states or an, uh, the individuals do not have any practical possibility to influence it. And if reference for a preliminary ruling uh, are not ideal, it may, this may play uh, part uh, in understanding whether the mechanism provided for by EU law for supervising observance of fundamental rights insofar as its, its full potential has been deployed, still be considered equivalent to the, the one of the European Convention on Human Rights. We all know that, the, that the, uh, there's a really more or less impossible uh, legal pathway to, for individuals to uh, access the Court of Justice of the European Union directly. And, uh, References for a preliminary ruling were considered by the European Court of Human Rights as, let's say, at least comparable uh, uh, procedural pathway for the for, for an individual, and for this reason, uh, the court in Strasbourg claimed there is a presumption of equivalence in the procedural terms. I'm not sure whether this is this would be possible uh, in this line of cases that deal with the rule of law and independence of judges anymore. At least I'm opening up this uh, debate uh, from now on. Uh, finally, and I will conclude with this, is I, I'm just raising other potential future possibilities or alternatives, uh, how one may further strengthen individual, individual right to uh, independence of a judge or a systemic uh, principle of uh, rule of law and independence of judges before the court uh, by uh, making a comparison with the individual application, typical individual application. I, I'm raising uh, three groups. One, three, one, the first one really relates to procedural step, the second one to legal effects, and the third one, substantive claims. What we have seen uh, some of these uh, approaches have been already uh, employed by uh, attorneys in Polish cases, uh, for example, strategic litigation, claiming uh, Article 18 uh, in conjunction with other conventional rights. Uh, and of course, we may expect at one point uh, probably pilot judgments uh, because of systemic deficiencies uh, 
uh, made by the court. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to take any more of your precious time, so I will probably stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for reflecting upon the lights and shadows of the case of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, you quoted advocate, uh, General Advocate Michal Bobek, and hopefully we are going to be able to listen to him now. Michal? So, member of the Hungarian uh, Judicial Council, which is uh, since uh, 2011, uh, when the new constitution of Hungary came, came into power uh, force, uh, has been the only kind of uh, counterbalance to the, to the very powerful uh, 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 role of the judicial office. Uh, which was mentioned yesterday. Uh, so practically the only, only organ uh, uh, back in Hungary, which somehow tries to still uh, uh, protect judicial independence uh, in the country, which is very much dismantled in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, Viktor Vadas is not only member of this council, but he was very much uh, instrumental uh, to somehow uh, get rid of the the previous head, the powerful head of the of the office, uh, who, as a sanction, became a judge at the Constitutional Court in Hungary. But anyhow, at least she is not not anymore. Uh, uh, using uh, uh, her previous discretionary power. Uh, so I don't know whether, whether we should discuss the issue of East-West divide, but uh, I don't know who else uh, realized during uh, Madalina's presentations that all the case laws referred to in her speech with one exception of a Portuguese case uh, were all from East Central Europe, mostly from Poland, Romania, and Hungary. So uh, with that, uh, I give the floor to, to Victor, who I, I guess will speak about freedom of expression, not only in Hungary, but probably in the region and wider in, in Europe. So Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I will try to share my uh, presentation. There we go. I hope you see see that. Since I was introduced, I will just uh, immediately start in med in medias res uh, with my my short presentation uh, about the freedom of expression of of magistrates. Uh, of course, I don't want to bore anyone with, with long academic uh, uh, lectures. The other speakers have a greater knowledge on this issue. But my starting point is the freedom of expression itself, because as we all know, freedom of expression is a basic fundamental right. It's one of the cardinal rights guaranteed under the European Convention of Human Rights, because it is closely linked to democracy's political process. And it is an indispensable tool for minorities and the civil society. The European Court of Human Rights has a consistent assertion that the interference with this right can be justified only by imperative necessities and the exceptions to this right shall be interpreted narrowly. The limitation can be justified if the measure is prescribed by law, it has a legitimate aim and it is necessary in a democratic society because of a pressing social need. It is very important to anchor that as a general principle, judges also have the right to freedom of speech and expression and the limitation to this needs, the limitation to this uh, needs to meet uh, these criteria and shall not go beyond this, which means there are certain limits for this limitation. I find it necessary to start with this because I see a tendency, especially in countries where the respect of rule of law, also the independence of the judiciary is not evident, uh, they were mentioned already uh, in 
the, also the public trust of the judiciary and also the perception of independence deter deteriorated uh, in the past few years a lot in these countries. And uh, the judges and judicial bodies, judicial associations seem to have problems overturning this neg negative tendency. Also in the same countries, we see that uh, judicial administration or the government is trying to mute judges. I think the negative tendencies uh, has a direct link with the, with the freedom of expression. What we see in Poland and Hungary, that there are huge struggles. Judges need to fight for their independence, which is constantly challenged by the government and also internally by the judicial administration. A uh, distinction can be made between the Polish and the Hungarian judiciary by the reaction of judges. In Poland, the judicial associations and the collective of the judiciary uh, they are quite resilient and tenacious. Meanwhile, in Hungary, the judges seem to be asleep or apathetic and only a very few judges speak up. But what is the reason? Why do they react differently? The answer has something to do with the interpretation of the freedom of speech, I think. In my opinion, judges need to understand the nature of the limitations of their freedom of expression, and they shall use the remaining freedom to raise public trust. In the next, uh, I think, 15 minutes, I will try to explain the limits of the limitations. Then I will give you some Hungarian examples straight from the trenches and conclude with, with the possible outcomes. In most of the European member states, it is uh, prescribed by law that judges have certain limitations to the freedom of expression, but is not limited equally, and there is no consensus in Europe. Therefore, the states have a certain discretion to set this level according to the doctrine of margin of appreciation. For example, in Lithuania, judges were allowed a few years ago, even encouraged by the Judicial Council to give a public statement regarding their own cases and explain the judgment to the public. Meanwhile, in Hungary, this is strictly prohibited. Only the president of the court or the sp spokesperson can make a public statement or comment on the resolution. It is very important that court decisions uh, shall be explained in a clear and understandable matter to the society because it raises the public trust in the judiciary. But uh, at this level, it is not significant whether the judge answers the question to the press after the resolution is passed or an assigned person on behalf of the court does this. There is a more important limitation to the freedom of expression, and this brings us to my main topic, the concept of political activity. In most European countries, political activity is prohibited for magistrates. I think the crucially important questions are the following. Is it a political activity if a magistrate criticizes the legislation or certain legal actions or any measurement of the government? Who defines political activity? Is this definition always foreseeable for the magistrates? Remember, it needs to be prescribed by law. Am I doing a political activity, speaking about the rule of law and fundamental rights right now in an international conference, while meanwhile, the Hungarian government argues that Hungary is constantly attacked by NGOs and liberal scholars with the rule of law? The prohibition that judges shall not speak freely needs to have a legitimate aim. Aims that justify the interference with the fundamental rights are listed in the convention. One of these is the maintenance of the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. Most of the cases regarding this issue, which were some of them were already mentioned, these cases deal with the external protection of the judiciary, the right for information about the proceedings, prevention, uh, improper, uh, improper influence on the trials, and the level of, of acceptable critics of public officials, and the protection of judges and prosecutors. But also, this is the aim of the limitation of freedom of speech of magistrates. It is not hard to see if judges are carrying out certain political activities, for example, giving a speech on an assembly of a political party, which 
is entitled to freedom of expression, but in exercising such rights, a judge shall always conduct himself or herself in such manner as uh, preserve the dignity of the judicial office and the impartiality and independence of the judiciary. Moreover, I think there, there is an even greater fear in the former so, uh, socialist bloc, where the people have uh, such an image of the judiciary where there is uh, no division of powers and courts are an integral part of the state, which is captured by one single party. Of course, I'm sure that might ring a bell in Hungary right now, but by, by nature, I think Hungarian citizens and Eastern European citizens with no regard to their political pre preference, they don't see judges as the good guys in, in general. And maybe that is uh, that might be an answer uh, that uh, Gaber was raising uh, before that, why are all the cases uh, uh, about internet, uh, judicial independence recent cases are from, from Eastern Europe and not uh, other countries uh, mostly. In the if the interference is prescribed by, by law and has a legitimate a aim, still it can only go to an extent that is necessary to feel, fulfill uh, the pressing social need. And this will be the limit of the limitation. According to the Bangor principles, judges may participate in activities, appear at public hearing before an official body concerned with matters relating to the law, the legal system, the administration of justice, or any related matters. So also the Bangalore principles named these as kind of uh, counter exceptions to the freedom of expression or to the limitation of the freedom of expression. Going back to my, my questions, uh, if judges are criticizing government measures or they protest for judicial independence, can an interference with their freedom of speech be justified? If the aim of the judges is to preserve judicial independence, how could the limitation be justified with the independence itself? My conclusion is, if the protest doesn't harm the dignity of the judiciary, it shall not be prohibited or interfered with. And also the Council of Europe has a recommendation on judges from 2010, which uh, says something similar, where judges consider that their independence is threatened, they should have effective means of remedy. I will go even further. I think it is a professional, almost moral obligation of the judges to speak up in, in such a case. Now I'm bringing some examples from Hungary. The first one already mentioned, so I will be very short on that, the Baca case. Andras Baca was a former president of the Hungarian Supreme Court, and he was criticizing the new administration model that was introduced in 2011, also mentioned by, by uh, Gabor, that the, hung the Hungarian government introduced this new model where before 2012, there was a Council of Justice, which was responsible for the whole judicial administration, where the majority of the members were elected by the peer judges, and the Council was presided by the President of the Supreme Court, who was elected by the Parliament with two thirds majority. Uh, the operative duties of the Council were assisted by an office, uh, and the head of this office was appointed by the Council uh, itself. But then, after 2012, the Supreme Court was absolutely detached with the president who remained member of the Judicial Council, but all the administrative powers regarding all the lower courts, these were transferred from the council to the president of the office for the judiciary, also appointed by the parliament. Beside the Supreme Court president, all the other members of the council were elected by the peer judges, but all the significant competences were given to one person, appointed by the parliament, while the council remained with very weak status and powers uh, as a supervisory body. So from this point, not the council had an office anymore, but the office had a council. And this was a major reform, and this was criticized by, by Andras Boko uh, from the beginning. And so at the end of the day, the government decided that uh, they rename, rename the Supreme Court and elect a new president to the Supreme Court of the Curia, and also a new president to the Judicial Office before the mandate of, of Baka would end. So his per, per position was terminated uh, uh, immediately uh, before the end of his mandate. And the European Court of Human Rights, as it was mentioned, uh, found this as an unjustified interference with his freedom of expression because it was closely linked to his uh, critics, to the government. 
The second uh, examples will be about the National Judicial Council of Hungary. Uh, as Gabor mentioned, as we got rid of the, the president, it was not that easy uh, to get rid of her, and it was not, not intentious. We didn't want to get rid of her. We, want, we wanted uh, a proper functioning of the judicial administration. Uh, the system of administration as I mentioned, was not only criticized by, by Andras Baca beforehand, but afterwards it was constantly criticized by various stakeholders and international organizations, Greco, Venice Commission, European Commission, but the Hungarian judges and especially the Hungarian Association of Judges, the Mobile, remained silent in the question. However, in the beginning of 2018, the judges of the Budapest Regional Court and your Regional Court of Appeal, they asked questions from the National Judicial Council whether the practice of the president of the office is in alignment with the law on the appointment and promotion of judges and court leaders. And the council concluded, uh, OBT is the council, concluded that there were uh, serious deficiencies in the practice of the president of the office, lack of reasoning, total lack of eff efficient remedy, clearly uh, discriminative measures, and in general, this was uh, assessed by the council as a misuse of rights, misuse of powers. As an answer to this, the president of the office launched a full-scale political attack against judges and against uh, members of the uh, council. She pressed some members and substitute members to resign and declared the council illegitimate. Uh, in the national broadcast, she, she called, actually she called me and one of my colleagues, traitors of the homeland for inviting the newly appointed president of ENCJ to Hungary. Uh, there were altogether five disciplinary proceedings against um, members of the council. Uh, and in the government friendly media, there were defamatory articles, uh, they were published, and it was a kind of a, like a smear campaign against the council and certain judges, which never happened before in Hungary. It was a totally new thing to, uh, to us. Uh, it was so so such a scandal, such a, uh, a campaign that, for example, in one of the papers in the media, I, I had an, my name had a hashtag. So if you put my name in the searcher, it listed all the results with all these defamatory uh, articles. Uh, meanwhile, the European Union became in Hungary the scapegoat and uh, was presented as a political enemy of the Hungarian government in the, in the media. And Hungarian judges, of course, need to apply EU law, just as all European judges. And in 2019, a Hungarian judge ordered a preliminary request from the Court of Justice. Uh, the basic question was about the right for a quality interpretation, but he was asking also questions about the internal independence of the judiciary. And on the motion of the chief general prosecutor, the Curia, the Supreme Court declared this order unlawful, which decision has uh, been public, published and now binding to our lower courts. And also a disciplinary procedure was initiated against this judge. And another example, my personal example, that in 2020, I was writing an article on Verfassung's blog with an, um, together with an administrative uh, judge uh, of the Curia with the title, A Game Hacked by the Dealer. This was in this article, we were criticizing the Hungarian case assignment practice of the Curia and concluded that it does not meet the European standards and it is not in alignment even with the Hungarian legal regu regulations. And uh, very soon, the new president of the Curia, who was appointed by the parliament against the objection of the National Judicial Council, he immediately confronted me publicly and asked me to revoke my statements as they were false. Nevertheless, I haven't heard or read any denial or counter opinion ever since. The question is how judges react in a situation like this. In Hungary, closing the courtroom door was the reaction and mostly this is the reaction. They are closing the courtroom door. They don't want to let anything in. They try to act as these threats would not exist there would not be a serious rule of law crisis in Hungary, or this would not affect their judicial work uh, at all. Why? Because 99% of the cases are irrelevant for the government and the remaining 1% are the relevant cases, mostly in the capital city. Therefore, most of the judges, they won't face a problem during their everyday work. 
and they believe if they behave well, won't be rebellious, they can work in peace. So if the rebellious minority is muted, the majority will voluntarily choose silence. But what are the consequences if you close the courtroom door? First, very soon, there will be an insurmountable distance between the reality of society and the judiciary itself. This is what we can describe as judges. They don't live in the society, but in an ivory tower. Just as all state institutions, the judiciary will not be transparent and judicial independence will be seen in the future as a kind of a privilege of, of a small group of people. The silence won't stop the other branches of powers to increase the pressure, to gain full control over the judiciary. The voluntarily silent judges will, will get the same reward for their cooperation, what, they, what the muted judges receive as punishment. At the end of the day, we will see that public trust and perceived independence deteriorates rapidly. And we all know that if it is very easy to lose public trust, but it's very, very hard to gain it back again. The legal order of the European Union and also the uh, economy is based on the mutual recognition of national court decisions, which is based on the mutual trust. Mutual trust will be a fiction very soon in Europe, I think, because if rule of law backsliding won't be stopped, no one will trust Poland and Hungary, not the government, the state, all together with the judges, with the courts. So instead of closing the door, judges need to open it somehow, I think. For this, they need to understand that they do have a freedom of expression. Moreover, they have a professional obligation to defend the rule of law. First of all, how judges see themselves uh, in Hungary, most judges see themselves, I'm afraid, as executors of the national law, highly trained state officials, bureaucrats who are solving cases instead of delivering justice. When I'm reading judgments of the international courts, whether the Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights, uh, I'm, I'm reading, they describe the national judges as they are the first line of defense, protecting the human rights and applying international standards enshrined in the conventions and in the treaties. It does not match. We need to change our own image to raise public trust. We need to change our own image to become uh, protectors of, of fundamental rights. Judicial training is crucial, not just transferring knowledge on EU law, not just raising awareness in general, but these trainings should aim to change the way of thinking, uh, to remain impartial. I will also criticize the European Commission right now, because at the moment they are forming, formulating, and preparing the European training strategy. And it's very good that the European Commission emphasizes that judicial training is crucial to protect rule of law, but they don't seem to care that the national training institutions might be captured in some countries, and uh, there is an adverse selection for the participants and lecturers for these uh, EU trainings. It's not accessible to all the judges, I think, in Poland and in Hungary. The judiciary needs to learn how to communicate uh, with the society, with the media, and also how to use social media. All judges are responsible for the image of justice, I think, also the silent ones. And there are no kind of abstain votes in this ballot. If judges learn to communicate, I think the first message that they should deliver is that judicial independence is not a privilege of the judges, but an integral part of the right to a fair trial. Your right, citizens, not mine. If you people don't protect your judges, they won't be able to protect you when the time comes. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, for this not very happy picture uh, about a member state of the European Union, uh, uh, Hungary. Uh, before I, I open the floor for discussion, uh, let me make two, two short comments. One, one is about uh, the European Commission's uh, uh, attitude towards uh, national trainings. Uh, I, I fully, 
fully agree with this criticism. Uh, and I, I just have to say that partly this is what, what we try to somehow uh, complement these national trainings uh, provided by and also uh, 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 EU supported uh, training program here. Uh, but on the other hand, we see the, uh, the, the disadvantages of such transnational training programs. As I pointed out yesterday that uh, besides Victor, there were no Hungarian judges uh, signing up for our, our training program. Uh, the other comment uh, is, is a kind of, of protection of the Hungarian judges against a very vocal uh, representative of, of the judges. So when Victor uh, argued uh, by saying that uh, uh, in contrast to Poland, Hungarian judges uh, do not really speak up. This is true, uh, unfortunately, but there are a lot of, lot of reasons for that. One of them uh, is a structural one. The Orban government in 2011 started its dismantlement of the Hungarian judiciary by introducing a new uh, uh, retirement age for the judges, lowering it from 70 to 62. Uh, and with that, actually, the Hungarian government uh, get rid of ten, one tenth of the Hungarian judiciary. Uh, those, those judges retired. Needless to say, those were the, the most senior judges, partly court presidents. So the whole kind of rule of law backsliding uh, started with this entire dismantlement of the Hungarian judiciary. And of course, uh, this was a message to, to the 90% uh, remaining judges uh, uh, how to behave. Anyhow, this is a, a, a very, very small addition to this uh, very, very nuanced and, and very gray picture uh, uh, Victor painted about the Hungarian judiciary. Uh, 